Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna go through some examples of function overloading. It's one of the most important things in programming, so make sure you pay attention. Let's first start with this swap function here, and then we'll go through some other examples after that. And just in case you're not clear what overloading is, you might wanna check out the previous video where we go in detail, but if you just wanna watch this one, overloading is just creating multiple versions of a function. And that's exactly what we're gonna show you how to do in this video. But first, make sure you check out our sponsor, Embarcadero Rad Studio. Rad Studio is the IDE of choice for C++ development. Quickly build native, mobile, and desktop applications from a single C++ code base and deploy it to Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. With Rad Studio, user interface design has been made easy with hundreds of pre-built components for cross-platform development. You can easily integrate with popular source control management systems, databases, APIs, and you can make your life easier with numerous third-party extensions. Let Rad Studio do the heavy lifting when it comes to C++ development. Give it a go with a free trial by following the link in the description. Now here we have this swap function that swaps two integers. What if we wanted to create another version that swapped strings, for example? So we can actually do that. We could say void swap, and this one is going to take strings. So we'll say standard string A and standard string B. Now make sure you include string. There we go. Now this is going to work in a very similar nature. We're going to make a temporary string. We'll assign that the value A, and then we'll assign B to A, and then we'll assign that temporary variable back to B. So when we compile this, you can see there's no errors. The reason there are no errors is because these actually have two separate signatures. This one takes two integers, this one takes two strings. If there was a repeating signature, for example, if we created a new swap and it took an integer and another integer, you can name it whatever you want, in this situation, we'll get an error. And you can see it says, call to swap is ambiguous. Basically, it doesn't know which swap to use. So when we pass two integers to swap, it goes and looks at the definitions of swap and it says, hmm, there's two exact copies of swap. The pass by reference doesn't actually matter here because from the caller's perspective, all it does is pass in the variables and lets the functions worry about everything else. So it's not able to tell which one to use. But in the situation with the strings, it can tell because we're not passing in two strings, we're passing in two integers. So it can easily tell that we want to call this one up here and not this one down here. But that means inside a main, we can call the other version using strings. So let's go through an example where we have two strings. We'll call one first name and the other one last name, and then we'll call swap and pass in first name and last name. Awesome. And when we compile this, you can see there are no errors. And when we do an output, we'll see that the names are in fact swapped. So we'll do first name first, do a space, and then we'll do last name. Let's compile and run. I actually have to pass by reference, sorry. So we need to go up here and make this one a reference and this one a reference. Otherwise, it's just gonna swap them in here, exactly what we talked about in, in one of the earlier videos. It'll swap them in here, but that won't persist outside of, outside of that function and they'll be normal in main. So in order for that swap to persist, we have to make sure they're being passed by reference. All right, so now when we compile and run, it should work. And you can see it does say Curry Caleb, so the swap works. So that's a perfect example of function overloading. Now I wanna go through another example from scratch. So I'm going to create a new file, and this we'll just call it, I don't know, math stuff. <laughs> Very creative. Then we'll just set up the basis. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually start working with what are known as structs. We'll talk about them in detail later, but just to get a little bit of, you know, looking forward, here's how you would create a struct. It's basically a custom data type. We'll say struct, give it a name such as rectangle, and then we'll define the elements inside it. We'll say double length and double width. So that's kind of how you define a rectangle and the size of the rectangle. Now let's say I wanted to calculate the area of a rectangle. Well, we can do that with a function call. So let's create a function, we'll call it area. And here's what it's going to do. It's going to return a double first off because it's going to calculate that area from two doubles and return it. It's going to take two doubles as arguments, so we'll have double length and double width. And what it's going to do is it's going to return length times width. 
So now let's go through an example of using this. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new rectangle and we'll assign it some values. So we'll say rectangle dot length is equal to 10 and rectangle dot width is equal to 10 as well. And we can call this function by saying area and passing in rectangle dot length and rectangle dot width. And this is going to return a double, so we need to do something with it. Let's just output it. Now let's compile and see if we have any errors. Make sure you've compiled the right program here. And it looks like I forgot a semicolon after the struct, so make sure you put that there. Now when we run, you can see it gives us the value 100. But we could actually make an overload of this where we don't need to pass in the length and the width, assuming we're working with a square. A square is technically a rectangle, it just has the same length as it does width. So let's create a new version of this where we only need to pass in one argument. We'll just call it length. And all it's going to do is it's going to return length times length. So that would be ideal if the length is the same as the width. And we actually have that down here. So if we want to do that, we can actually just make a new version of this. And instead of passing both of these in, we'll just pass in length. Now we can compile and run. The first output we get 100, and the second output we get 100. Now I can actually make a third overload of this where we pass in the rectangle itself. So let's go through an example of that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say double area, and this is going to take a rectangle, and we'll just call it rectangle. And what's gonna happen is it's actually going to return rectangle.length multiplied by rectangle.width. Now how do we call this one? Well inside a main, let's do another output. And instead of passing in a length or a width, we're just going to pass in the rectangle object like so. Now we can compile and run. And you can see we get 100 every single time. So here is an example where we overloaded the area function with three different overloads. And the way it knows which one to call is based on how we call it inside of main. So this is pretty cool. We're going to continue to work with this stuff in future videos, so be sure to stick around. If you've enjoyed this content or it was helpful, be sure to subscribe. Now I know we haven't really talked a whole lot about structs, but we are going to get into those in detail, so be sure to stay around for that as well. Thank you guys, I'll see you in the next video.